All right. Hi, you're 11. This is Mr. Lim here again. And this is uh, the third video on atomic structure about the relative atomic mass and mass spectrometry. All right. So these are the things that we're going to be learning. All right. So what we're doing effectively is working out the mass of an atom in this process. And why are we working out this mass of the atoms? Because Mr. Lim says so. No. Um, some areas of chemistry, chemistry involve the calculation of the number of atoms so how many of them there are partaking in a reaction, okay? That's how many atoms are taking part in the reaction. Because the atoms are too small to count, the, we weigh them, and then from their weight, we can work out how many there are. It's like saying, if I have 150 grams of apples, and I know that each apple is 10 grams, then I know that there are 15 apples there, All right? But to be able to do this, we need to know how much each atom weighs, and then we need to know the total mass. Okay, so in that previous example, each apple weighed 10 grams, and we know that the total mass is 150 grams, so therefore we know that there are 15 apples there. However, it gets more tough because we should know that isotopes have different masses, even though they are of the same element. So, not all atoms have the same element, weigh the same amount because they have different isotopes of the different elements, different number of protons and neutrons. So we need to be able to work out the average weight of the atoms of an element to be able to calculate. But to do that, we need to know the mass of each isotope and the percentage sample of each isotope represents. So that's like saying, uh, okay, not only do I have um, 150 grams of apples, but there are now two types of apples, one that weighs 8 grams and one that weighs uh, 12 grams. All right, so you'd have to work out the mass of each isotope, that's the 8 and the 12 grams of each apple, and the percentage of those particular types of apples. All right, so maybe it's 50-50, uh, and so therefore they have an average mass of 10. All right, and so they you'd still have 15 apples. All right, um, elements on Earth all have the same distribution of isotopes. Okay, so if you're talking about a sample of carbon, all right, a sample of carbon has the same distribution of isotopes, that's C12 and C13 and C14. That means that they have the same percentage of uh, those isotopes all across the world. So if you take some carbon from one part of the world, take some carbon from the other part of the world, they'll have the same distribution of isotopes unless you've purposely created a unique enriched sample, so that's what they mean by enriched uranium. They get, they try and make it so that there's more of one particular type of isotope, right? Or you're talking about an extraterrestrial source where the iron from a meteorite might come from a different planet and therefore have different iron, um, iron isotopes uh, distribution, all right? But generally, we just deal with the same ones all on Earth. Right, so we just need, we then just need to work out the distribution of the isotopes to work out the average mass of each atom, as well as, you know, how much each atom weighs, uh, to use it in further calculations to work out how many atoms there are in a particular sample. Okay, so how many atoms there are in a sample? Well, it depends on how many different isotopes you have, what percentage they are, and how much they each weigh. All right, so that's what we're going to work out using this. Okay, uh, now since remember that they are way too small to weigh in grams, okay, so they're too small uh, to talk about weighing them in grams, we have a different unit and one where we compare each atom to a standard amount. That standard amount is 1 12th of a carbon 12 atom, which happens to be 6 protons and 6 neutrons, so therefore, one twelfth of that is effectively roughly the average mass of a proton and a neutron. But remember, neutrons are slightly heavier, but the average mass of them is roughly one of those one twelfths. Therefore, one twelfth mass of a carbon-12 atom is known as one atomic mass unit, okay? Or an AMU. It is the unit for the relative, because we're talking about it's relative to something else, the one twelfth of a carbon atom, atomic mass, or RAM. Okay, the AMU is the unit for the RAM. Whilst the RAM of an isotope will often be very close to the mass number, okay, because remember the mass number is the number of protons and neutrons, and we just said that the uh, 
AMU is roughly how much one proton or neutron weighs. So they're going to be very similar, but they will not necessarily be the same thing. However, some questions assume that sometimes it is, right? So you just have to read what the question says. So to get the distribution and mass of each isotope for an element, we have to run it through what's known as a mass spectrometer. All right, so we're looking to get the distribution of isotopes as well as their relative atomic mass. Okay, made up of four parts, the ionizer, the accelerator, the deflector, and the detector. Okay, so uh, let's go have a look at that and I might just draw one quickly over here. All right, so mine is very, very um, rudimentary. Okay. Uh, okay, here we go. So, the ionizer. What? Oh, that's not what I wanted. The ionizer. What it is is that it vaporizes the sample, which means it turns it into a gas by turning it into very high temperature and a low pressure. Is then ionized. Okay. So in other words, you've got gaseous parts of that element which is ionized. What does that mean? It turns it into a positive ion. What's an ion? It's a substance, it's an atom that has an imbalance of protons and electrons, which means it's no longer neutral. If you take away some electrons which are negatively charged, it becomes positively charged. And if you take away one electron, it turns into a one plus charge ion. Okay, so hopefully we remember some of this ion stuff from year 10, but that's what it means. And if you don't understand, just come and ask. All right, so you take your turn your element into a gas, then you ionize it, and so now it is all positively charged with one charge things. So effectively, you might have an, oops, that's not what I wanted. You might have an isotope of five protons, five neutrons, and now it only has four electrons, which means it's got a positive one charge. And you might have another uh, atom with five protons, six neutrons, and still four electrons with a positive charge. And this one will be slightly heavier than that one because it's got an extra proton. Okay, so that's the ionizer. It turns it into a positive ion. Next is the accelerator. What does the accelerator do? It accelerates stuff. Okay, so the ionized vaporized atoms or ions are then now accelerated via charged plates. Okay, so now they're all positively charged, so you shove a negatively charged plate somewhere near it and they'll all be attracted to it. And then it's focused by putting a slit in that plate, so a single stream of positively charged ions is produced. So here you have all of your positive, oh, that's what I wanted. Yeah, uh, here you have all your positive charge things just sitting after being vaporized. Then you put a negative plate here, maybe a positive plate here as well. And so now all they all get attracted to this positive plate. And if you leave a little slit in the middle, they all fly out in a single line. Okay, that's the idea. So the accelerator, attracts them and then forces them to go out in a straight line. Okay, so that two parts there is your ionizer, your ionizer and accelerator being kind of put right next to each other. And so now you have a stream, oops, that's not what I wanted, a stream of positive ions, some of which are slightly heavier than others, All right? because of the different isotopes. Now we have a de the deflector, which is the stream of positive uh, charged ions uh, will enter a magnetic field. And it's an electromagnetic field because they control the strength of it. So it's like a charge plates which create a magnetic field. The magnetic field will deflect the stream of ions because remember, they are attracted to negative charges or they can also be attracted to um, uh, north and south poles of magnets, right? and they move off their path by varying degrees. So the same concept of the wind blows the balls, uh, but if you've got a lighter ball, it'll be more affected by the wind rather than a heavier ball. 
so the heavier the particle, the less it will deflect. This separates the streams of isotopes from each other. Okay, so what does that mean? Here I have my uh, stream of things, right? And all of the green ones will go this way, and all of the yellow ones will bend slightly more in that magnetic field. All right, maybe, actually, I'll just redraw that a bit less bendy because i can do some other stuff with it. Okay, so that only bends a little bit. That bends a little bit as well, all right? But a little bit more. Now, if you are to turn up the strength of this magnet, effectively turn up the wind, what you will be doing is you'll make them bend more. So they'll bend that way, right? So depending on the strength of this, uh, these magnetic fields, you can get them to go either, you know, this path or this path or this path. Just those yellow ones, you can get them to go through all three of those paths, right? Depending on the strength of the magnetic field. But the idea is that you've got them in different paths at least, okay? So you've got the green one there and the yellow one there, okay? So, the magnetic field is then increased slowly and then is, you know, and, and as it is increased, the different streams of isotopes would be directed into the detector, lightest first to heaviest last. Okay, so let's have a look. Because remember, you are moving these this way, right? You can get this one to go into the detector, which is here. Okay, detector, deflector. Okay, so here is the little opening for the detector, and then that stream of particles will go there. Over, if you increase the strength of the magnetic field, that goes that way, and then eventually the green ones will follow the same path at a stronger magnetic field, all right? Whilst the yellow ones bend further that way. Okay, so then the green ones will go past. Okay, so what this detector does then, the detector, the different streams of isotopes enter the detector, all right? And the detector records how many impacts there are over a certain amount of time. So how many hits per second, effectively. The impacts per time indicate the distribution or abundance of the different isotopes, okay? So here, in this example, because there are, uh, you know, three of the yellow isotopes, which are lighter, and only two of the heavier isotopes, that means that there'll be more hits per second of the yellow one and less hits per second of the green ones, right? So maybe there was three per second for the yellow ones and two per second for the um, green ones. And that's a, what the detector will read, okay? So the impacts indicate the distribution or abundance, which means that, you know, because there were less of the green ones, there's less of them, and then you can work out the percentage, right? Um, these impacts and times are displayed in graphical forms in different ways, either by the absolute amount or the relative amount. And if you have an absolute amount, you have to convert it to relative amount, which is something we'll go over in the next video. But the idea is that, oops, that's not where I wanted to go. Let me go through all of this stuff again. Yeah, here we go. All right. Uh, what you'll see is that there'll be an amount of something there, so some sort of unit there, and a mass to charge ratio, which is effectively, since most of them are charge of one plus, they'll just be uh, the mass effectively. And for the green one, you'll see that there's a smaller value than the yellow ones, okay? And there's no other um, atoms or elements present there, okay? And so therefore, this amount might be relative amount, so there might be uh, three per second, and this might be two per second, or they'll just give you a value like 30 and 20, all right? Or they could be as a percentage, because out of the five, there were three that were yellow, so therefore that's 60%, and that's 40%, okay? So this would be showing a relative amount, 
and this would be showing an absolute amount, so 30 and 20. So you notice that this one here doesn't add up to 100, but this one does, the red one does, and so therefore uh, that's the difference between the relative and absolute amounts, and you'll have to convert that, and we'll go through that in the next video. All right, so that's mass spectrometry. Um, see how you go, and answer the questions, and if you have any uh, problems, come and ask me in class. Adios.